Jokaval, Rachel uh, I um, was asked when I came in, as I'm asked virtually every day at least several times, what on earth is happening in Britain? To which my answer is, I've only been in politics 50 years. What do I know? <laughs> but we are living in the most unusual, turbulent, and uh, disruptive times. And this debate that we're having today uh, is situated and offers part of a solution, I believe, to the uh, severe crisis that the United Kingdom faces politically, economically, in the context especially of Brexit, but uh, the conditions that gave rise to Brexit. I think that the, this debate uh, in part answers or seeks to address that. Now, I was involved, as Rachel indicated, in leading for Welsh Labour the 1997 referendum campaign working alongside Ron Davis and then the 1998 um, Government of Wales Act and as you mentioned the 2006 Government of Wales Act that delivered the full lawmaking powers to Wales uh, which I brought in as Secretary of State for Wales. And I was pleased against that context and that background to be asked to join the Constitution Reform Group which has produced this uh, Act of Union bill, which I think many of you will have copies of. And it's the first time anything like this has been done. And I just want to talk to you a bit about the background of the group, what the bill is in essence, the politics of it, and then Paul will provide an expert analysis of it. What struck me about this group when I was asked to join it was that um, it's, an, it's a cross-party group about reforming the relationship between the nations of the United Kingdom and the regions as well, and that it was initiated by leading conservatives. Now, up until then, and the group was formed in 2015, the pressure for reform had come from Labour, Liberal, Green, and radical constitutionalists of various kinds. I'm talking about fundamental constitutional reform in Britain. Obviously, the Nationalist parties, in, including Plaid Cymru, have had their own agenda and input into that. The point is that the others have been quite indifferent to or resistant to this change. If you think, for example, of the Conservative bloc on House of Lords reform in uh, 2012, despite it forming a key part of the last uh, government's uh, coalition agreement. But when I was approached in, uh, as I say, 2015, July 2015, to join the steering committee of the new group, I discovered that the main motivation was born out of a belief by serious and influential conservatives, headed by the chair of the group, the Marquess of Salisbury, an hereditary peer and the former conservative leader of the Lords, that without wide-ranging constitutional reform, the very future of the UK was imperiled, not the least by the threat of Scottish um, uh, secession. So they were approaching a debate that many of us have been involved in and many of you have been involved in for a lot longer from an entirely new perspective. What also impressed me was the inclusion on the steering committee of uh, Lord Lisvane, the highly respected former clerk of the House of Commons, Robert Rogers, and one of his expert former uh, parliamentary Council, Daniel Greenberg, and also, of course, Paul Silk, um, former clerk to the Assembly, as Rachel has described, and a House of Commons clerk before that. So this is not a bunch of radical enthusiasts of the kind that uh, I have often um, mixed with in, in the past. Paul accepted, of course. <laughs> Paul accepted. Um, but actually key members of the British establishment. And the fact that they were thinking seriously and radical about this agenda was interesting in itself. Also on the committee uh, is, is my colleague um, from the Labour Party, Lisa Nandy MP, who's doing some really interesting work on towns and their alienation both from cities uh, and also from the politics uh, of the political elite and the, the economics of the political elite. She's, 
the, she's established a center for towns, which I think it's worth uh, having a look at, to, to look at the disjunction, and I'll touch upon that in a moment. So she's a member of the group as well, and so is Ming Campbell, the former leader of the Liberal Democrats. And it seems to me that the analysis which we've collectively uh, put forward is quite compelling, and we've done so with very little argument. Uh, namely, that the constitutional status quo cannot remain except at the cost of dismembering the UK and leaving all of its constituents, nations and regions immeasurably weaker, in my view, uh, in a world of much bigger and more powerful nations and blocs. And we've identified an agenda for reform which also, amongst other things, addresses the asymmetrical devolution across the UK that has left England with an understandable grievance, and not just on the political right, as the most centralized and therefore disenfranchised part of the UK, London accepted, of course, because London has its own powerful assembly. And the introduction of English votes for English laws procedure in the House of Commons is a symptom of this. So we've got a whole series of reforms and changes and pressures and disruptions happening uh, against the background of the work that we've been doing. House of Lords reform is another question that we've addressed and, and raised. And there's a, an, a divide on the steering committee which is frankly expressed in the text of this uh, bill between those who believe that the Lords should be abolished in favor of an elected English Parliament so that the House of Commons would become a federal uh, parliament for the whole of the UK, more or less except in name as it is now. Uh, but the House of Lords would be um, the English Parliament. So that's uh, a view held by Robert Salisbury and a minority on, on the committee. I just note in passing that representing 85% of the population, that parliament would be so dominant in Westminster that it would effectively replace the Commons as, as the fulcrum of Westminster, sidelining Wales and Scotland uh, and also Northern Ireland even more. And my own view is different. My own view and the majority view on the steering committee, I think, is that a Senate or House of Lords should be at the very least majority elected, I've always believed this even though I'm an appointed peer, on the same day as a general election, ideally by a list system of proportional representation on the same boundaries as apply to European elections, which would mean that each of the nations and regions within the UK would be properly represented, fairly reflecting the aspirations of all of our citizens, helping bind us back together in a, in a way that um, both Houses of Parliament have palpably failed to do. So I'm not suggesting that the House of Commons electoral system changes, that the single member constituency system changes. It's very difficult to change it after the 2011 uh, referendum. Uh, but, um, uh, but that actually that the, a Senate or whatever you call it would be, as the second chamber, would be able to provide a counterweight uh, to a constituency-based House of Commons. So that's, that's what I um, uh, think should come out of it, and I think that's a majority view on the committee. I think that um, also that it would enable in England a, a permissive form of devolution in either building on the city regions or regional government. I think if you offered the people of Cornwall and the northeast of England and Yorkshire and Humberside now the opportunity for a really powerful uh, form of regional government as opposed to what was offered in the 2004 referendum to the Northeast, which was a Mickey Mouse assembly with uh, very few powers and got rejected in part because of that. I think Cornwall and the Northeast would jump at it, uh, probably Yorkshire and Humberside, and I think they would lead uh, what became a momentum towards regional devolution uh, across England and that would kind of address the asymmetrical devolution across the UK. We've also been able to address, as Paul will doubtless describe, a lot of the issues involved in all of this, a big, big agenda from finance of a federal structure of the UK to defense and security in a way that I've not seen addressed before, uh, certainly 
uh, on a comprehensive basis, even by those who, with a long track record of lobbying for constitutional reform. But I want to stress that in this notion of a federal UK, the Act of Union bill proposes a bottom-up rather than a top-down arrangement. Effectively, what we've done is turn the whole devolution structure on its head by making it a bottom-up system in which the nations and hopefully the regions outside London of England federate upwards. So they're the sovereign base of the, the, cons of, of the constitutional uh, union in which they decide what they want to happen at the center for them. Presumably, defense, security, taxation, finance, um, uh, and so on, um, uh, uh, being the main, the main issues. There might be others, but those are the main issues. So what we've had up to now, and I've participated in it because it's the only way of delivering something I passionately believed in, for example, devolution for Wales, is it's been the center saying that Wales, in this case, uh, is able to get more powers from the center. It's devolved from the center. What we're talking about is Wales, in this instance, deciding over the road in the Senate what um, it wishes to have at the, uh, vested at the constitutional center of the UK. So it's a complete inversion of what we've had up to now. And that is the essence of, of the federal structure. We've also argued as a group that we're not saying we've got the final word, that there should be a wide consultation in this huge agenda involving citizens, NGOs, civil society groups, the nations, and the regions of the UK as well. That could be through a constitutional convention or some more traditional mechanism, a speaker's um, uh, public inquiry, whatever you decided to have. There are different vehicles for it. But you couldn't simply proceed, as it were, by introducing our bill without wider consultation. And by the way, the bill has now been printed in the House of Lords, accepted by the, the clerks as a legitimate piece of legislation. So it's a serious bit of work. But it's vital that um, I think we get on with this agenda, because I think the crisis in which we're plunged over Brexit and so on is part of a much wider picture. And uh, I think that we could see separatism, certainly in Scotland and possibly uh, on the island of Ireland, de developing as a result of um, this, uh, uh, this turmoil. For example, polling suggests that the Brexit crisis around the Irish border is swinging opinion, among, including amongst unionists, small at the moment, but interesting, towards triggering a referendum which is provided under the Good Friday Agreement on whether to unite with the Republic or not. The, the, I always believed that the crisis around the Irish border would be the Achilles heel of a hard Brexit, more than anything else. Uh, and that is turning out to be the case. And it is, it is also uh, throwing Northern Ireland politics, such as it is because the, its assembly has been suspended for nearly two years now, a catastrophic uh, uh, event and very, very serious indeed. And I say that as somebody who negotiated the settlement that brought um, Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness together to rule together uh, on a basis that lasted 10 years in 2000, from 2007. I think the crisis at the moment is really serious. Um, but that is throwing the whole status of Northern Ireland up into the air as well. Then on top of that, we've got huge divisions in our society reflected in Brexit, the towns versus the metropolitan cities. Uh, if you look at the, the voting patterns in the referendum, there's a very stark divide between rural and urban, between towns and metropolitan cities, and increasingly different countries reflected uh, there. And I don't just mean in England, by the way, it's true in Wales as well. Uh, uh, and so I think that this is, goes really to the whole future of our politics. You've also got a difference between young and old, and all of this is happening, and I don't think it's an accident it's happening, under the dominance of the neoliberal economic agenda, which is causing huge divisions and huge inequalities, and is going to continue to cause that against a background of um, getting on now for 10 years of austerity, which, in my view, is a modern Keynesianism 
I think is completely unnecessary uh, and, and ideological. It's also worth noting that David Cameron's 2015 government, like that of Tony Blair that I served in in 2005, was elected with just over a third of voters and a quarter of the electorate. A third of voters and a quarter of the electorate elected those two governments. The trend towards democratic illegitimacy has grown since the mid-1950s. Now, you could argue that was reversed a bit last year with a much higher turnout and the two major parties breaking back over the 40% threshold but, um, from the early 30s. But nevertheless, I think there's a trend been going on for quite a while. It's not simply Scottish antipathy, English discontent, or the Irish border crisis that threatens the future of the UK, but I think there's now a widespread sentiment right across the, uh, the society that the great majority of our citizens uh, feel that the democratic system no longer represents their interests. If that doesn't worry uh, everybody enough to examine the case for reform, it's high time it did. And I think this new act of union is one of the key, if not the key, ready-made vehicles to address that serious agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel, very much for your introduction. And it's always the job of a clerk to be dull and boring after the excitement and the enthusiasm that politicians show. So I'm going to, uh, as Rachel said, take you through the bill and explain the different sections of it. And then I hope that in the Q&A session afterwards, we'll have an opportunity to expand on some of that. As Peter said, this is a new act of union for the United Kingdom. Uh, its intention is to express the purpose of the United Kingdom, something that's not been done, as far as I'm aware, in statute ever before, to provide a fundamental structure for the UK that are based on principles, something that uh, was very important when I chaired the Commission on Devolution, that we based our proposals for Wales on principles, and this act is based on principles, and, and on processes which will command the support of people throughout the United Kingdom and each of its countries. It's a union, basically, that we see that each country in the United Kingdom will want to be part of. Some of this uh, piece of overarching constitutional legislation is new. The creation of a broadly federal system of government, new governance arrangements for England, and House of Lords reform, which Peter has already alluded to. But the bill also doesn't tinker with, preserves some of the features of the present system. Uh, the idea of mutual support between the nations, the idea of shared rights and values. And where something is working well, or perceived generally to be working well, like the, uh, the court system and the judicial structure, uh, the bill doesn't attempt to interfere with it. So it's not a new written constitution of the United Kingdom, although it is intended to be a profoundly important constitutional piece of legislation. So the overall structure of the bill is to uh, provide for a union which is broadly federal. There will be a central government and a legislature dealing with matters on a UK-wide basis, but the governments and legislatures of the countries of the United Kingdom will deal with all other matters. Now, the main difference between the present incremental system of devolution that we have in the United Kingdom and this bill is, as Peter has said, this bill starts from the assumption that each of Wales, England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland is entitled to full sovereignty and to self-determination. This, in our view, should be the starting point of the Constitution. The centre, if you like, the centre in inverted commas, should be created by uh, those nations to deal with matters which they uh, believe should be addressed on a shared basis because they believe it's more efficient and effective to do so. The nations therefore choose to pool their sovereignty to a defined and limited extent. The union is a voluntary act for each of them. 
So in this way, in our view, this bill provides an alternative both to devolution and to independence. The bill enacts core purposes for the Union and core functions to be addressed at a central level. There will be a mechanism for changing either or both of those, but that will require a sufficiently high degree of consensus to avoid constant change at the whim of the government of the day. The aim is to achieve stability while allowing for the necessary flexibility as events change. So let me take you through the bill. Uh, it's divided into parts, and the parts are divided into clauses in the normal way of the bills, and I'm going to talk about each part, not normally about clauses. Speak up. Sorry? Speak up. Uh, is that a problem? Sorry, was that a general problem? No? I will speak up, though. I, I'm relying on the, on the microphones here, so uh, I hope that that's working okay. Uh, part one of the bill says what the purposes of the UK are. It then affirms the continuity of the United Kingdom as a union between England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and establishes the principle that I've already mentioned of self-determination for those nations and parts. It also says what the core purposes of the United Kingdom are. And uh, we may discuss those later, and you may have different views about what the core purposes of the United Kingdom ought to be, but we include the rule of law and equality, the protection of fundamental rights and freedoms, the provision of a safe and secure society, the provision of a strong economy, and the protection of civil and economic rights. So uh, you can see the sorts of things which are uh, referred to in uh, normal uh, agreements, treaties on human rights are there. Part two then talks about the central policy areas. Part two establishes the matters on which the individual nations and parts of the United Kingdom choose to pool their sovereignty to achieve more effective and, ef and efficient governance. The initial central areas are listed in the schedule to the bill. Uh, the part two refers to that schedule. And they'll determine the legislative competence both of the centre and of the non-central legislatures of the restructured union. The areas of competence of the central governments and the areas of competence of the non-central governments. Again, we may want to discuss this, but you will see that the areas which are uh, defined as central areas in the bill are the United Kingdom, Parliament, the Crown, the Principal Devolution Acts, Ministers of the Crown, Foreign Affairs, Treaties, the European Union, uh, the European Union membership, that's an interesting one to leave in there, but let pass by that, the EEA, Defence, NATO, Human Rights, Central Bank Functions, Monetary Policy, Government Borrowing, the currency, financial services, central taxes, by which we mean core income tax, corporation tax, inheritance tax, and value-added tax, the Supreme Court, national security, nationality, immigration, extradition, emergency powers, the civil service, and political parties. And all of those, uh, or many of them, there might be some argument about whether they should be central functions or not. I mean, the civil service is a, is a classic one which has been debated a great deal here in Wales and in Scotland as well. Non-central legislatures will be able, under our bill, to legislate incidentally outside their area of competence with the consent of Parliament. And if there are disputes about competence between the non-central legislature and the central legislatures, and the central government and the, the non-central governments, then they will be resolved as they currently are in the Supreme Court. Part three deals with England. And uh, as Peter has said, it makes provision for the governance of England in two alternative models. The first model involves the creation of a directly elected parliament in England to deal with non-central areas 
the, the areas like health, education, local government and so on, which are presently devolved to Wales and Scotland. Effectively, England would be given what Wales has. The second model continues the present position of Parliament legislating both on central matters for the UK as a whole and on matters for England alone. But it puts the uh, English votes for English laws, evil as it's called, uh, which is governed at present by very complicated standing orders in the House of Commons, it puts evil on a statutory basis by restricting legislation on England-only matters to English MPs alone. It also allows cities and regions within England develop, to develop self-governance through the increased use of city deals and the development of new regional arrangements. Now, this would require, as many of the parts of our bill would, uh, other pieces of legislation to implement it in detail. So it's, it's, I don't really approve of framework, framework bills, but this is a framework bill in that sense. It, it provides a framework which will have to be uh, fleshed out by other legislation later. Part four deals with Scotland and makes high level provision again for the governance of Scotland, essentially confirming the present arrangements for devolution while uh, extending, because of the areas which are now to be devolved to Scotland, extending the competence of the Scottish Government and uh, Scottish Parliament. The Scotland Act 1998 would remain, though, the core <coughs> act about the Government and Legislature of Scotland. Uh, the Bill also provides that all matters of legislative and administrative procedure in Scotland will be determined by the Scottish institutions themselves. They would not be matters for which the uh, central government or central parliament would have any control. Part 5 makes similar sorts of provisions for Wales. Uh, the bill uses the term Welsh Parliament, uh, Seneth Cymru, uh, not to preempt the discussions which are going on just across the road at present, but because I think it was very important for us to uh, recognise that what we were imagining the future when this bill was drafted, before this discussion started, was very much a parliamentary institution, uh, not the institution we used to have in the past here. The Government of Wales Acts 1998 and 2006 and the Wales Acts 2014 and 2017 will remain the core acts about the government and legislature of Wales, but competence is massively in, extended to all but the central policy areas, and as in Scotland, all matters of uh, legislative and administrative procedure in Wales will be determined by our own institutions and not by uh, imposed by central government or the Parliament at Westminster. Uh, clause two, if you tw clause twenty-two, if you look at it, is all about the removal of control. Part six refers to Northern Ireland. It's uh, a particularly uh, thin provision at present, and that reflects the uh, constitutional turmoil which Peter has referred to, which Northern Ireland is presently in. But it's, uh, it, it's a marker that uh, Northern Ireland, uh, the governance of Northern Ireland must also be covered by this sort of legislation in the future. Part 7 deals with Parliament, uh, and Parliament under the new system. Again, it offers two alternative versions to match the two alternative versions for governance of England, which I referred to earlier in part three. Version A of, uh, abolishes the House of Lords, and uh, the United Kingdom will then be, the United Kingdom Parliament would then be composed of two units, as it is now, uh, an, in, an initiating chamber and a revising chamber, or a scrutiny committee, we equivocated between these two words, and I think that the word that you'll find in the bill is the scrutiny committee. The House of Commons would become the reconstituted UK Parliament. To reflect its changed responsibilities as a central federal parliament, the number of MPs would be radically reduced to 146, though double the number of members of the European Parliament, and that would mean that there would be eight Welsh MPs. The national legislatures 
would each provide a, uh, would provide the scrutiny committee of this new parliament, this, the revising chamber for this new parliament. And reciprocally, the MPs return for Welsh constituencies, those eight Welsh MPs, would ref together form a scrutiny committee or a revising chamber for the Welsh Parliament and similar provisions we made for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Now, very importantly, uh, the revising chambers in both cases, in the case of the UK Parliament and in the case of the Welsh Parliament, the Scottish Parliament and so on, will only have the functions that are conferred upon it by the body that it scrutinises. So this is a permissive power for the, uh, there to be a scrutiny revising chamber for the UK Parliament or a scrutiny revising chamber for the Welsh Parliament. But in, let's take the case of the Welsh Parliament. It'll, that scrutiny revising chamber will only have functions and could have no functions uh, depending on the decision of the Welsh Parliament. So it's an op opportunity they have to have a revising chamber, not a compulsion to have a revising chamber. Version B uh, revises the House of Lords, reforms the House of Lords. The number of members in the House of Lords will be reduced to around 400, with three quarters of them being directly elected and 25% being appointed. The elected members uh, would be elected by uh, provisions made under the Representation of the People's Acts. Uh, we think probably based on regional and constituency arrangements used for European parliamentary elections, but there would need, in our view, to be overlapping periods of office so that uh, you didn't have everybody uh, retiring at the same time. The appointed members would be appointed by a new appointments commission and in the same way, broadly, as is intended now, they would reflect uh, expertise in uh, business, expertise in professions, expertise in culture, and, and so on, as uh, peers do at present. As with the first version, there will be revising chambers uh, for the Scottish, Welsh, and Northern Ireland legislatures drawn from the regional representatives in the House of Commons. What this version doesn't do, actually, is do much, it doesn't do anything to alter the present structure of the House of Commons, and that's perhaps one of the areas where uh, we ought to come back and think a little bit more in the future. Part eight of the bill deals with public money. Uh, and uh, we have been, we've benefited from the advice of uh, a number of academics in this, this area, uh, Dave, David Bell from Stirling among them. The principal mechanisms are set out in that part which will control the raising and expenditure of public money under the revised system. Again, we set out some public finance principles. That central functions should be financed through central taxes. The Welsh and other governments should be free to raise local taxes and to spend them on local functions. That tax revenue should be applied by the Welsh and other governments so far as possible in the interests of accountability that central taxes should be shared with, within the union on the basis of local need and different taxable capacity, that the Welsh and other governments should be able to raise funds through public borrowing, but not at the expense of central financial stability of the United Kingdom. The draft bill contains a number of taxes which are uh, intended to be raised at central level. I've mentioned these before, income tax, corporation tax, inheritance tax, and VAT, and other taxes uh, currently collected by HMRC. The inclusion of income tax in the list of central taxes is made expressly without prejudice to the right of the Welsh and other legislatures to make provision for altering the rate of tax. And I guess many of you, like me, will have had last week, excitingly through your letterbox, a little leaflet saying that you're about to pay a Welsh rate of tax. Uh, uh, you have Erville and me to thank for that. <laughs> uh, flexibility in the light of experience and fiscal change is provided by the ability to amend the list by an annual budget, uh, an annual finance bill at the time of the budget. The draft bill introduces the concept of occasional public spending acts to adjust the distribution uh, mechanism for public expenditure in different areas of the country from time to time. 
there's an initial presumption of distribution by reference to average per capita formula with modifications to reflect circumstances and changing needs. The draft bill also provides for the establishment of a UK funding committee to operate the distribution principles include in, in accordance with the Public Spending Act. The aim is to uh, avoid a repetition of the current problems with the Barnett formula, which as we all know is a solution which was intended for a temporary, per, a temporary period, but which has been entrenched due to the lack of any mechanism for its development uh, and adjustment, and uh, uh, has been roundly criticized by everybody, but nobody has um, had the uh, option to have it replaced by something better. On public borrowing, the draft bill permits each non-government, non-central government to borrow money to fund public expenditure. It establishes a public borrowing board to set limits, terms and conditions for public borrowing. And it provides for borrowing within those limits, terms and conditions to be certified as authorised borrowing, which is automatically underwritten by central government and is therefore expected to receive favourable treatment in international financial markets. The Bank of England is renamed as Bank UK and there's a provision in the uh, bill for it to continue to exercise central banking functions for the United Kingdom and it, importantly for Wales and the other uh, constituent nations of the United Kingdom to be represented on the board of the bank. We also recognise the transitional rules will be necessary to ensure an orderly and affordable transition from the present distribution systems. Part 9 deals with defence and security. Now, foreign affairs, defence and security are identified by the Bill as central functions uh, to be exercised at a UK level. But Part 9 of the Bill imposes duties on central authorities to ensure that functions are Interests are exercised in the interests of protecting and enhancing the security of all citizens and complements those duties by duties on the authorities in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland and so on to cooperate with one another and with the central authorities for that purpose. Because the other constituent nations have a, a voice that should be heard in these areas, we require the bill will require the establishment of a defence and security liaison committee to coordinate UK and defence security, <coughs> defence and security on a nationwide base, basis, including proper briefing of and consultation with the Welsh and other governments in that process. Part 10 deals with home affairs. It confirms some of the key components of the United Kingdom wide home affairs mechanisms. It makes provision about the UK-wide court system. It uh, makes a provision which I'm sure some will, in this room will find controversial about a UK-wide civil service. And it provides for a ministerial council. For us in Wales, there's one important change here. A specific provision is made uh, requiring the Lord Chancellor and the Lord Chief Justice to make provisions for dividing the High Court of England and Wales into the High Court of England and the High Court of Wales. Uh, clause 52, I think, which deals with the, uh, the Ministerial Council, could perhaps be strengthened. Uh, as many of us will know, the JMC has not always worked very effectively in the past. Part 11 uh, talks about how this should all come into force and provides for a commencement referendum. It's a, it's a word one uses very hesitantly nowadays, a referendum, but we think that it's in, uh, essential for this, if this bill is to have come into force, it has to have wide, wide support and be funded, founded on consent. Now, to ensure that people have absolute clarity about what they're going to be voting for, we're not proposing a pre-legislative referendum, you'll be pleased to hear. Uh, what we're proposing is that there should be a post-legislative referendum. So this bill should have been enacted and then will be followed by uh, a referendum so, or referendums so that people will know exactly what they're voting for. That referendum will require a 65% majority across the United Kingdom as a whole. So 
very high threshold, a, a, a threshold of votes cast, I, I may say not of, of the electorate, that would be an impossibly high threshold, 65%. 65% majority of votes cast in the United Kingdom as a whole, and a simple majority in each of England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. The questions for the referendum are set out in the bill, I think, in, in, a, in a pretty simple form. And there's the requirement that the referendum should be held uh, between 10 and 14 months after the enactment of the bill. Well, this is a private peers bill. Um, it looks like any other uh, bill in the House of Commons, but it's a private peers bill introduced by uh, my old friend, former clerk of the House of Commons, Lord Lisvane. Private peers bills do not become law. Uh, but like all private peers, private peers bills and private bills from members of parliament in the House of Commons, and indeed the equivalent procedure here in Cardiff, it is an attempt to start a process and to stimulate debate. And when the ideas behind the bill are sufficiently persuasive, bring about legislative change. So it's the beginning of a process. Uh, it's certainly not the end of a process. And we thought it was very important not just to talk about these ideas, but to express them in a form that looks like legislation. Most backbench bills are not as ambitious as this one. That means we've exposed ourselves on multiple fronts to, uh, to criticism, to debate and discussion. But we don't think that there's anything wrong with the ambition for a better constitution especially, as Peter has said, at a time when so much constitutionally is in flux. We don't pretend that the bill is perfect. There are some deliberate loose ends. Peter's referred to the two versions of the governments of England as the rudimentary nature of what we say about Northern Ireland, uh, the uh, rudiment rudimentary nature of what we say about the Ministerial Council or reform of the House of Commons, or even about the public finances. The purpose of events like this today is for us to engage with people who are interested in these subjects, to hear from you, and we hope uh, at the next iteration, when a bill is produced in the future, to uh, have established more common ground and to build up uh, more momentum inside the United Kingdom to have the sort of constitutional change which this bill represents and which we think that the country needs. Thank you. Many thanks indeed. That was really, I'm sure you will all agree, a tremendous opportunity for us to find out firstly a bit more about the Constitution Reform Group, the range of different um, questions that they're addressing and the broader context within which this draft act has been, the act has been uh, pulled together. And also um, really, really helpful that you actually went through, uh, went through the, the bill stage by stage and I saw various people scribbling in their, their copies throughout. So, um, now we have a, a healthy uh, 40 minutes or so for, for questions and discussions. We have a, a couple of people on hand with roving mics, so if you can wait for them to reach you before you um, launch in with your question. And if, if uh, you don't mind, if you could introduce yourself uh, in advance of your question, that will help us continue discussion beyond, uh, beyond this hall. Right, who would like to go with the, the first round of questions? I'll take a few at a time, so uh, one at the back, then two at the front, and then three. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for that. It, it, was, it was fascinating. Um, I wonder, Paul, sorry, I'm Daniel Winkop from the Wales Governance Centre. I wonder, Paul, if I could draw you out a little bit on the question of the division of the High Court into a High Court of England and High Court of Wales, and what this group has thought, if anything, about the question of the single jurisdiction of England and Wales and the allocation of policy competences in areas of criminal justice and policing and so on, how that would play out. And just one very small and slightly pedantic, excuse me, observation, the Act begins by talking about the, the, the peoples and the constituent nations and parts. Subsequently, it refers to sub-national uh, 
Parliament and the Northern Ireland Assembly. So it seems that there's a, a kind of an ambiguity about the level at which the idea, or levels at which the idea of the nation or nations is, is applied. Might it not be more accurate to refer to the parliaments as sub-state parliaments, given that they are, in another sense, uh, most of them national parliaments? Um, yes, the front. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Geraint. It's on its way. There we are. <laughs> uh, uh, Geraint Talman Davis. Um, uh, we, uh, are, if, if Brexit goes through, we are looking at um, a pretty massive sort of repatriation of powers from Europe uh, to the UK. Um, much of that actually going to the central, uh, to the UK Parliament. Do you think that this? Um, represents an, a major obstacle to what you're proposing, or does it actually m make such proposals more urgent? David Marquand. I was a member of Parliament long before Peter, but I didn't stick the course, I'm afraid. I am interested in the mechanism through which this could become, there could be a, a, a consensus for it. I think that the Con Scottish Constitutional Convention, which paved the way for the uh, devolution to Scotland, uh, and was the reason partly why it achieved an absolutely massive majority. Of course, as we know, the majority in Wales was minuscule. That Constitutional Convention clearly um, mobilized Scottish opinion it went on for a very long time. All, all sectors of Scottish civil society were represented in it. And I think the final uh, devolution for Scotland uh, wouldn't have happened, really, and wouldn't have had the same massive consensus behind it if that constitutional convention had not existed. Now, that was just one, one nation. But do you think there could be a we could take a leaf out of that book and have a constitutional convention of somewhat based on that model for the whole of the United Kingdom. On Dan's question, uh, the, uh, as you can see in this bill, it's a very long and uh, complicated bill. So uh, there are many, many issues that uh, in the occasional meetings we have of the group, we perhaps don't discuss in the, the detail that uh, some of us might want. So I don't remember detailed discussions about the, uh, 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 about the future of uh, the court system in uh, England and Wales. But I think that we were clear that uh, the direction of travel, the, 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 um, the devolutionary direction of travel, I have to be careful of the words I use because I said this is not about devolution, but the devolutionary direction of travel is towards a separate court system in Wales. And as you will see from the central policy areas, justice, uh, other than areas like terrorism, is not reserved as a central policy area. So it, justice would be under this bill devolved. It would achieve what the commission which I chaired wanted. Um, and in those circumstances, it is absurd to have a separate, uh, not to have a separate court system for, uh, for Wales. How that should be shaped exactly uh, is left in the bill for the Lord Chief Justice and the Lord Chancellor to work out. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm sure they'll be aided by uh, Lord Thomas's commission, which, <laughs> when it reports, I'm sure will have some interesting things to say about that. Um, you're right to pick up on the, um, the subnational word. Uh, Peter and I will know there's been a recently been a, uh, an email exchange between members of our group about uh, the use of some of these words inside the bill. It's exactly the sort of thing we need to pick up and to get, get right in the future. Uh, the uh, subnational is a word, uh, as I understand it, which is used much more commonly in the economic literature. Uh, nations, the, there is a certain Peter would know this better than me, certain antipathy in Northern Ireland to the use of the word nation for, for Northern Ireland. 
And so we have to be very careful about how we describe the parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, and we may not always have got that entirely right. Shall I just say something about the other for you, Peter? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Yes, sorry. Um, Brexit. Uh, I think there are two, two comments that I'd make, and I'm sure Peter will want to ex expand on this about Brexit. Uh, the first is, it, it, in my view, the reunification of Ireland, the independence of Scotland is made much more likely by, by Brexit. Therefore, this bill uh, shows a more attractive union. That's the intention to show a more attractive union which will encourage the people of Scotland and the people of Northern Ireland to want to remain inside the union, which is really important, I think, for us in Wales. <laughs> because uh, if we are left as the only non-English part of the United Kingdom, that is really a, a rather frightening future for Wales. But the, the, uh, in the immediate terms, of course, it's taken a lot of eyes off this particular ball. Uh, so much energy, intellectual energy in London is going into uh, preparing for Brexit. Uh, and I think when we've tried to talk to people inside the Cabinet Office about this, they're preoccupied with other things. Uh, but I absolutely agree that the Constitutional Convention was so important in the development of uh, the Scottish model for devolution and having something like that, perhaps, uh, one hopes having ministers who will say in London, well, we are now in such a mess that we need to do something and we need to have a constitutional convention that looks toward how, how our country can develop in the future is what we hope for. On uh, Geraint's question and David's questions, if I focus on those, yeah, I do think that Brexit makes this whole debate much more urgent and necessary. I mean, we are, we've gone into something um, almost by default. And what, without Rachel trespassing into a whole debate on Brexit, what is very clear to me is that people voted against something, but they didn't vote for anything. And indeed, it's very clear to me that the Brexit leaders don't have a plan of their own. They don't have a plan of their own, certainly on the Irish border and on a lot of other things. And we are kind of stumbling into a situation, if it goes ahead, and uh, I'm an advocate of the people's vote to try and rescue something from this uh, absolute calamity and crisis, but that's a separate issue. Um, if, it, if it did go ahead, then I think that uh, the strains on the present constitutional structure will reach breaking point. And Paul has virtually said the same thing. So I do think it becomes more urgent. And I think that Brexit happened, uh, Geraint, in a way that, um, you know, has got very deep roots. It, it was a revolt, I think, more against the political elite, generally, uh, having knocked on hundreds of doors in the South Wales valleys, than just um, Europe. Europe was the convenient scapegoat for that, and there were grievances about Europe, and I'm not seeking to diminish those uh, um, and the views held by those who voted Brexit, but I think there was a general um, reaction, certainly in the South Wales Valleys where, and, and the area where the majority of the population are, are, uh, are concentrated, by people who just felt the system wasn't working for them. And, and the constitutional part of that is an important part of that. I, I don't think, you know, an act of union will suddenly remove the grievances that um, caused Brexit, I think most of them were economic, actually. Um, more than anything else, identity and immigration were also parts of that. So I do think um, it makes it more urgent. And David, uh, I'm glad you asked your question because I referred to a constitutional convention in my opening remarks. I don't think you can bring this in without the same process. And I think that, um, as you indicated, it's not an accident that there was much bigger buy-in in Scotland. There were other reasons as well. Scottish identity has always been politically and constitutionally a bit stronger than, than, than Wales's, is, um, for all sorts of reasons that I'm not really qualified to comment on, just observing it. And perhaps that allows me to say something about um, 
the whole legitimate part of, I happen to disagree with, was a very important part of our politics, which is the, the nationalist imperative in Scotland and in Wales, uh, and in Northern Ireland for that matter. There is something in it for nationalists too in this agenda. Because if, it, if for example, for the SNP, if the SNP can't win a referendum, and they're treading very delicately at the moment, and in Wales, I don't think anybody thinks an early referendum is likely, or if it were triggered, would be won. But it, for nationalists and their own mission, this bill actually offers a much more radical departure from a centralized British state, if you like. Uh, and we have been one of the most, until the devolution impetus started, and in England we still are, one of the most centralized uh, of modern democratic uh, nations. So I do think there's something in it for them to engage with too, though they may see it as a threat, and they may see it as a, um, you know, a kind of fudged halfway house to their own agenda. But actually, just as you know, the SNP engaged in the whole debate around Scottish devolution, I think it would be the, open, the, the door would be open for Plaid uh, as well to do so here as well. In other words, this is not, this is a case for holding the union together, something I strongly believe in for a lot, lot of other reasons beyond something called British identity. In fact, that's not my major impetus. I think that um, the redistributive, uh, redistributive um, uh, opportunities and actualities of the whole larger conglomeration for, a, say, a nation like Wales is too big a prize with a much lower GDP per capita uh, uh, to turn our back, especially on the 40% of the UK that delivers, um, uh, the, the, the parts of the UK that deliver 40% of our GDP, which is around the third of the population in the southeast in London. We've got to be very careful of turning our backs on that. That's why I've also been very wary uh, to hostile about income tax devolution. That we don't find ourselves part of a, a neoliberal agenda that actually got nothing to do with devolution but is offloading the state onto its constituent parts and getting rid of it uh, so that you raise your own money and you look after yourselves. And the, the prospects for redistribution, and I speak in that context as a socialist, just disappear. So that, for me, that's a lot of the impetus behind this bill is that agenda. Hi, uh, thanks, uh, Peter and Paul, for some really interesting comments. Um, in many respects, this is not just a really detailed, serious piece of work, but quite radical uh, in, in the way it looks towards recasting the United Kingdom. However, in some other respects, it's actually quite a conservative document in the sense that it, you know, recasts in, in a different way a, you know, the, the sort of traditional model of parliamentary democracy. And it seeks to reapply that in, in somewhat different ways in the United Kingdom. Yet given, for instance, some of Peter's earlier comments about you know, the distance between elites and, and much of the public, do we not need also to think a bit more radically about the way in which we bring our democracy to life, that it, maybe we need a bit more than just the traditional model of parliamentary democracy applied somewhat differently and very occasional referendums. Might there not be lessons to learn, for example, from our next door neighbors in Ireland where they have um, you know, quite significantly used the model that some political scientists call by the fantastically unsexy name of aleatory democracy, you know, the use of ordinary citizens um, often randomly selected ordinary citizens being involved in detailed, you know, deliberative considerations of serious political issues. Um, you know, that, that's one example which, which you can see other instances of it uh, elsewhere around the world. Um, you know, don't we need to go a little bit beyond just the traditional model of parliamentary democracy recast in a somewhat different way if we are to address these issues of distance um, and alienation from political elites? How do you spell aleatory, Roger? I, th I think it's A sorry, it's my L E A T O R Y. All right. Um. I've learned something. <laughs> right. Spelling B2. Thank you. And uh, just behind you, actually, just the gentleman behind you. My questions take uh, sort of two, of two kinds. One is to do with the bill itself, but one is to do with uh, outside of the bill. You, it's, you, you mentioned that this is a private peers' bill and that it stands 
but no chance of being passed. So I would say perhaps you should put the cart before the horse and address, if, surely this is an important piece of legis legislation, that's why we're here to discuss it. So there needs perhaps a consideration to try and change the private member's bill process so that it is subject to the same parliamentary process as governmental bills and, all, and will be decided by votes for and votes against without the simple uh, call of object killing the private member's bill. Why should private peers' bills and private me uh, members' bills in general of MPs be able to be knocked on the head as if they're of less importance than um, ordinary government legislation? And I think there is quite a move in, in the House, Commons at least, to actually reconsider this. So if this could be changed, then maybe we could actually have this on the statute book. That's the first question. With regard to the bill itself, um, I hope that the notion is, because we've seen in austerity many councils have come together, so there's been increased centralization. I feel that we need to see in as much localization as possible, district councils having maximum amount of powers, then the next level up, county borough councils having as much as possible. I would say that having mayors is really an anti-democratic process, centralizing power in one person. With regard to you know, agriculture, many people would, not, would like to have control over that regarding, say, uh, genetically modified foods or badger culling, so that have that very much at the, uh, you know, the behest of Scotland and, and Northern Ireland, etc. that level. With regard to immigration, I think that maybe Wales would, f for example, would feel, no, we don't like the process that we can't have Syrian children as much as we would want to in, in Wales and have the process change regarding that and the dispersal system as well. So all these are things which perhaps should be at the, cent you know, at the uh, uh, not at the central level. There seems to be quite a lot which could come down. So I don't, what, your, what is your feelings regarding uh, uh, such matters? Hi, uh, Sarah Moran, I work at the Assembly. I'm also a part-time student at Cardiff University. Um, the bill retains um, the supremacy of the UK Parliament. I was hoping you could share some of your discussions around the principle of parliamentary sovereignty um, and how that reconciles with the draft, please. I, I think, Roger, you're right in a way that it's both very radical and also conservative in the sense that it's, it's dealing with a parliamentary level of democracy rather than a participatory democracy. I haven't come across this aleatory democracy, but I, I'll, I'll have a look at that. Um, and I don't, think, uh, it, I don't think it would be easy to do anything else in this, but I don't have a closed mind on it. I mean, personally, I'm in favor very much of, 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 a, of, of a participatory democracy from the, from the bottom upwards, and that bears on your point too about it's not just say at the Welsh level, it should also be at local council level. Um, so I don't think the bill excludes this, I just don't think it was its core uh, issue. The core issue was to get the constitutional structure of the UK into a, an explicitly federal structure uh, in which, as I said before, that um, power is vested upwards by decision of Say in Wales's case, we decide, that's to say, um, currently the term the assembly decides over the road what it wants at the centre. That's a complete change. So I, I don't think it excludes a participatory democracy or whatever other description you want to give it, and I would certainly be wanting to, to back that in underneath it. Um, which then, yeah, I do think that we've got to be very careful that we don't, it, this isn't, doesn't become a power grab at the as it were, at the Edinburgh Cardiff level. Um, but equally, I think we've got to be, if you are going to have a system of regional government in England, you cannot have a two-tier system of local government. I think you have to have unitary local government like we've got in Wales. One of the reasons why the North East referendum failed, and I knocked on doors in that referendum in 2004, is they didn't address that question. So it was seen as another layer of politicians, of bureaucracy, and for the kind of populist objection to that, if you like, the big C conservative objection to that, it was, um, it was done on that basis. 
and you, I think it would be very difficult to win a referendum if you didn't have unitary local government, though I'm in favour of neighbourhood democracy under, underneath uh, local councils. But let's be very clear, local councils, if you are going to um, re-empower local councils, have to be given the resources. And, and what we've done under this, uh, you know, since 2010 is actually done a very good job of killing off local government by the sheer massive budget cuts that they're grappling with and, and destroying the faith of local people in their, in their local services as a result. Um, Sara, your, your point about parliamentary sovereignty, was Sara, was it? Yeah, your point about parliamentary sovereignty, I'll, I'll leave Paul to give you an expert one on that. I, I recently um, exercised parliamentary privilege under the Parliament's sovereign, sovereign in a very controversial way. But, um, I, you know, I think sovereignty would still be... Sovereignty would be divided between the nations instead of it all being at the centre. You'd have a very rebalancing of sovereignty. I think that's a fair way of describing it. Or so you tell me if I'm wrong, Paul. Um, in the sense that if Wales is saying what we want done at the centre rather than the centres, the sovereign centre is saying what you can have, which is what it has been up to now, then I think that creates a very different template for what we mean by sovereignty. But here's the expert. Uh, <laughs> you. Over to you. No, I'm not the expert, but I, I, th I think that the... Uh, uh, I'm just a jobbing politician, you know. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> the, the first and third questions are the same point in some, some way about con, uh, how conservative is this as, as a document. Um, and I, having worked on the expert group on the assembly electoral method with David Farrell, I know quite a lot about now about the, the different things that are being done in Ireland and the exciting things that are being done in Ireland. So that is no way excluded from what, no. what we are thinking about. But I suppose the most conservative thing is that we accept the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty in this, uh, this bill, the idea that ultimately uh, what the UK Parliament says goes. Uh, and uh, without, in the absence of a written constitution which takes that power away from the UK Parliament, that's the constitutional system we're, we're, we're lumbered with, if you like. But I do agree entirely with Peter that as you move towards uh, changing the way in which things operate in practice, so sovereignty changes. Sovereignty is, in a sense, devolved. I think that when you have in... Yes, the UK Parliament can abolish the Assembly tomorrow. It can abolish the Scottish Parliament. But does anybody believe that's going in the realm of credible politics? No. Uh, so sovereignty changes, I think, uh, 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 through um, systems becoming use, used accepted and wanted by the people uh, who are uh, the beneficiaries from them. Um, the, the extent to which we've got it right in the uh, list of matters which are reserved to the centre uh, is obviously something that will be debated and you mentioned immigration as an example of that. Uh, we've decided in this bill that immigration should be there, but uh, there is a perfectly credible argument that immigration should be determined by the constituent parts of the UK separately. Uh, but somebody has to set out a first attempt at this, and I think we've tried to do that in a way which we think is logically coherent. As to the procedure for private members' bills, um, yes, you're right that many members of the House of Commons, and I'm sure members of the House of Lords, do think that the odds are stacked too heavily against private members' bills and private peers' bills. Uh, Rachel said at the beginning that I've done some work in other parliaments, and in other parliaments you'll find that there's a lot more opportunity for uh, private uh, members, backbench MPs, uh, to promote legislation. That can result, as it does in a country like Ukraine, in uh, an enormous backlog of legislation not being considered properly. Uh, that's probably the other end of the spectrum from what we've got in the UK, but certainly private members' bills and private peers' bills, uh, without the blessing of the government, get nowhere in, the, in, in our parliamentary system in London, and that 
Act is probably not a good thing. Thank you. Uh, Richard thank, you. Jones, uh, thank you both for not only a uh, really interesting presentations, but for all your work on this. Uh, I'd like to challenge Peter, I think, on, on England. It's, I think it's no surprise that England is clearly the most difficult thing that you've had to think about, and you made, uh, in your uh, eloquent way, the case for English regionalism. The problem with English regionalism is that the English really don't want it. Uh, I've spent a long time looking at these data. Um, the only thing less popular than uh, English regional government in England are city regions, in fact, which is setting the bar very low uh, indeed. And I think that if this kind of scheme is going to work, and especially if it's going to get uh, support of in a referendum in England, then you've got to, you've, obviously there's a high bar to be crossed. And I'm afraid that treating England as a unit is, even though I accept that you're right, it's 85% of the whole, it's extremely difficult, but I'm afraid that that is what all the evidence suggests that the English want. And therefore, I think that for those of us who are not English, and if you want to stay in the UK, that we have to find a way of living with the English desire for England, which is not an unreasonable desire for England to be treated as a unit, even if it's massively inconvenient for people trying to draw up constitutions. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mena Richards. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Peter and Paul. It's a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, my question is about where next. Uh, I mean, you've been very open about the difficulties uh, and the fact that you're trying to stimulate debate and to engage interested people. But I wonder, um, given the urgency, Peter, in particular, that you talked about, how you build momentum behind this and what, for example, has been the reaction, if there has been any at all, in Whitehall, amongst the political parties, amongst the legislatures in Wales, Scotland, and indeed in Westminster. Um, and while it is a fascinating and interesting constitutional exercise for us here today, uh, I wonder how you propose to take it to the next step. Uh, um, indeed, whether that is your role. Thank you. Dechua, uh, Richard, the Wales Governance Centre. Um, I'm really interested by the way you sort of redesign Parliament and redesign the role of Welsh MPs through scrutiny committees, um, creating an oasis of a bicameral approach to some. Uh, functions from the Welsh Parliament. And I wonder if you've had any discussions about when or in what sort of policy areas the Welsh Parliament would feel appropriate to give Welsh MPs a sort of oversight role. Um, by the way, I just wanted to welcome David Melding here because I, I thought that um, you've done some incredibly interesting writing on this, uh, David, so good to see you here. Um, and as I said at the beginning, in a sense, with the exception of yourself, up until this group, what has been missing is really heavyweight conservative uh, interaction with this debate in a kind of creative way. And, and I very much welcome what you've been doing. On um, Richard's point about the English don't want uh, regional devolution, well, I would challenge that, although the, the, the past um, you know, the, you're right that that has been the case in the past. The exception of London. And London likes the fact that it's got an elected assembly uh, and, and a mayor. Now, OK, London is a bit of a country on its own, actually. I mean, it's a completely different place to the rest of England uh, in all sorts of ways, in its cosmopolitan culture, its racial identity, its multi racial identity and in, in, its, in its increasingly a different voting pattern entirely on class grounds as well to the, the rest of England. Uh, so it may be that London's the only place that wants it, but I would bet you that if you, if you took a poll now uh, in, um, for a serious region, form of regional government, as I said, in the Northeast, I bet you it'll win. I bet you it'll win a referendum. And I should think Cornwall would as well and I think Yorkshire and Humberside would, and then the others will start to think, hang on, what about us? So that's why I use the term permissive. Now, um, if, and John Denham, my former cabinet colleague and actually close friend going back many years to the late 70s in the Labour Party, who heads up this very interesting institution, the 
at Winchester University on English identity. He's doing a lot of interesting work. I don't know whether you've engaged directly with him. You have, yeah. But I mean, he doesn't agree with me. He thinks that English identity is something that's been suppressed, as it were. Um, uh, well, I think that's a good thing on the rugby field, but we're talking about the Constitution. Um, and he thinks that if you don't give it a parliamentary expression, then that's quite uh, difficult. I don't agree uh, if you want to keep the UK together. I just think with a big brother England and its own parliament, 85% of the population and a larger percent of the GDP, it would determine who the prime minister is. The federal parliament prime minister um, or whatever title it, it exists there, but presumably it would be a prime minister. I, I mean, you, you couldn't actually have that. That person would be chosen by the English parliament on a federal basis, unless you had some weighted system. But it's very difficult to see how that would happen. And so I think you're starting to put a whole series of different strains on the operation of the UK um, constitutionally. That's why I'm in favor of devolving beyond a London. And it's already started with the city regions. You'd have to then, and it would be for the people of, let's say, Lancashire and Merseyside to decide whether they wanted to expand upon Liverpool and uh, and Manchester, whether they wanted to keep those city regions uh, which have an economic identity, or whether they wanted a kind of regional um, you know, uh, structure around them. So that it's, a, it's a bit messy in that respect, but I think it could evolve on a permissive basis. And I, I really don't see what the alternative is. And it, it comes back, if you had an English parliament, it would be just the same centralized system of England, London excluded, as you've got now. <laughs> I don't think the English in the longer term would be uh, 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 happy with that. And by the way, I think the other Achilles heel of regional government in the past, especially what we tried under John Prescott in the um, early part of the century, was based on the English economic regions, which in some respects make no sense. I mean, the southeast region was a, was a, a complete you know, monstrosity. It had no identity, actually. Um, and no kind of common, even transport links. So uh, I, I think that was a mistaken road to, to start down, and I think we need to do it on a fresh basis. Mena, good, good to see you, and your important questions. How do you build momentum? Well, at the moment, because nothing else matters except Brexit, it's difficult. Um, but that's why we're holding these kind of events, and one in St. Andrews, and. Uh, and engaging with a whole different series of layers of civil society and, and politics. Um, and you know, I think the next step is to continue this momentum, but I think there should be, I would like to see, and maybe it's something that if um, you were interested in the center, Rachel, would be to see a more systematic engagement with this uh, at a Welsh level and to see a demand coming for a, a constitutional convention from Wales and from Scotland and uh, from England as well. And, you know, um, Northern Ireland is more tricky. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's got its own kind of constitutional sort of future around it. But I do think that we, we've got to keep pushing it. Richard, you, um, your question essentially was, uh, about scrutiny and so on. I'll, I'll let Paul go into the detail of that. But I think um, it was a question of how you, in part, why I was interested in the idea, and it's, a, it's an idea to float, is that if you have got a federal structure, then there's a much better two-way process between your federal MPs, as it were, at the, uh, the Westminster end, and your parliamentarians at, at the Welsh end, uh, and that's, kind of a much closer interaction, I think, especially to cover those issues both ways that are, are um, vested at either end of the, the M4. I have to confess that I start from the position of being a unicameralist in, in the UK Parliament terms. Uh, uh, and I think that the Scottish Parliament has worked very well as a legislature without having a, a revising chamber. But there is an argument that having a revising chamber would benefit a, a, a legislature and uh, having the elected representatives in the, the federal parliament as the revising chamber for the, uh, for, the, for the national parliament 
does make a lot of sense. But what was important for, for me and for all of us, I think, was that this was a revising chamber which will only have the functions which are given to it, given to it by the chamber which it's going to revise. So uh, if the Welsh Parliament decides that it doesn't want to have a revising chamber, that revising chamber won't do anything. Uh, so it's a permissive power which we, th we think uh, does make sense and is something which we could all agree should be here in the bill. Uh, in terms of where next, I agree entirely with what Pete, Peter's said. Um, what I have been very interested to see, without naming names, is the way in which um, uh, the chair of our group, uh, uh, Lord Salisbury, can open doors which most of us can't. <laughs> so there have been discussions with all sorts of people where he can have access, and he, he really is pushing this forward yeah. in a way which... Uh, I, I guess has been something which his family has done on constitutional matters for 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Yeah, I'm Chinelo Bobo Samo. I'm a student at Cardiff University. I said the bill is radical and moves UK closer to a federal system. Now my question is, has a written constitution not become imperative instead of having a litany of different legislations? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, where's the microphone? Yes, super. Thank you. Hello. My, my name is Rodri Williams. I'm a barrister here in Cardiff and also a member of the Wales and Chester Circuit. I wanted to pick up on the very first question, which was about the jurisdiction uh, and the requirement to set up a High Court of Wales and a High Court of England. Um, it seems to me that the, legis the draft is, is very unusual. In, in that it says at Clause 20, it puts a requirement on Parliament effectively to change the status, uh, the status quo rather than doing it immediately. So if you compare, for instance, what happens for the English Parliament, it automatically gets all the powers that aren't the central policy ones, uh, whereas the Welsh one has to have, um, has to have um, further legislation passed. Um, and what, what that means is, unless and until that happens, of course, the issue, the um, matters of, um, of jurisdiction, uh, criminal and civil justice, will remain centrally, and therefore there would be no point in having uh, separate high courts of, uh, of, of justice. And then secondly, um, the threshold for the referendum. Um, <laughs> one has to say, if there had been this rather high threshold of 65%, in another referendum we had, we may not be in the mess that we are in now, but pausing on that, effectively what you're saying is that we need virtually two-thirds of the English voters to decide this, or it simply won't go ahead at all. It, it, was that what was intended? And then the final question. No? Okay, thank you. And then, Judith, you do get in. There we are. We do get your question. Thank you. Uh, Judith Marquand. Um, now University of Cardiff, but basically from a long career in the Government Economic Service dealing with things like regional policy and public expenditure. Uh, assuming that there is general agreement, this is the sort of direction forward that we ought to be taking, what do you think are the next steps we here in Wales should take to further uh, understanding of what is proposed? I mean, we explicitly, on the first question, we have not gone for a written constitution. Uh, I think that gets you into a whole other debate, which is extremely um, hazardous, uh, given the constitutional history of Britain. I'm not saying it's not something to be explored, uh, and I'm, not, I'm you know, fairly neutral about it. But for me, you have to concentrate on what you can actually achieve. It's, you know, in the case of, say, Welsh devolution, which I played a part in, is something deliverable. This is deliverable in principle. I think a written constitution, I'm not sure that's deliverable. And I think it would take a lot of very big brains to try and uh, bring it about, if I could put it that way. Um, Rodri, on the threshold point, yeah, I, do, I, I mean, we've put it there because you'd need it as, as a way of actually creating a really solid foundation for that. It's not the final word on it. Nothing in here is the final word on it. It's, it's our best shot from, as it were, scratch of, of what we think would be the, the way to go forward. But it is a very 
high bar, but on the other hand, um, it stops you kind of doing things that you know, are un unpredictable and have unforeseen consequences, as we've just started doing over Brexit. Um, Judith, your important point about what c next can we do in Wales? Well, I sort of, as, and that addresses Mena's point as well earlier on. I mean, I think it would be great if there was a, a, a next stage of wider participation in this debate, if you think it's an important one, that requires addressing beyond the kind of Wales bubble, as it were, and I don't say that in a disparaging part of it at all, disparaging way at all. Um, I've been part of that and still am to some extent, but uh, I think it would be really good. Um, I think in some ways, I think it's easier to start this debate in a very serious way in Wales than it would be in Scotland. We'd have a, a much more antagonistic um, uh, sort of immediate kind of uh, context in which to have it. Uh, where, whereas relations in, in Wales between somebody holding my position and say Plaid Cymru members, the engagement has always been a lot more fraternal if I'm allowed to use that term, or uh, uh, a willingness to debate and engage rather than simply as it were hurl insults at each other. Uh, so I think it would be really good if, if you found ways of, whether it's your centre, Rachel, found ways of taking this debate forward and in a sense testing it to destruction and seeing what, how this bill in its current draft could be improved upon. I think that would be really valuable. I think I'd certainly welcome it. I'm sure the whole of the committee would actually. Our problem has been getting sufficient engagement yep. because in a sense, as I described at last week's steering committee meeting, we're ahead without a body. Um, and uh, it's the only way it could have started, but the more, as it were, body you can create a, and more movement, you then can create an embryonic um, sort of constitutional convention arising from uh, the bottom, as it were, rather than something that Westminster des decides it would like to summon. Uh, I think that would be extremely valuable and may possibly change the whole nature of the debate around um, our wider political architecture. I think this occasion has been really interesting and stimulating and I, I think at our last steering committee we talked briefly about doing the same sort of things in other parts of Wales so we might have the, a similar event in Swansea and Aberystwyth and Bangor and uh, I, I think that would be something which would get the debate going in the academic community at least and, 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 and the wider community out there. Um, just on Rodri's point about the uh, uh, justice matters. Um, please tell me if I mean, you're a lawyer and I'm not, whether we've got this drafting wrong, but the intention is in this bill for all matters which are not reserved matters to be matters within the competence of the uh, Welsh Parliament. So justice will be a matter within the competence of the Welsh Parliament under this bill. Uh, the division of the High Court into the High Court of England and, and the High Court of Wales was specifically mentioned because uh, we thought it was worthwhile putting that on the face of the bill uh, rather than uh, relying on a schedule uh, saying the justice is devolved uh, to allow something to appear to be an interference with the way in which the, 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 the High Court of England is, is uh, which is obviously not a matter within the competence or would not be a matter within the competence of the National Assembly, the Welsh Parliament. Thank you very much. Right, I'm afraid that um, time is marching on and it's now time to draw proceedings to a close. Many thanks indeed for sharing your time today. And um, yes, onwards with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you.